we were just hit by the most violent of situations. These, you know, the militia fighters were in trenches, dug in strongholds, who were heavily outgunned, outnumbered. They had very powerful weapon systems on their positions. And uh, we just weren't achieving what we can achieve with boots on the ground. So basically there was a command made by my superior to prepare me and my men in the back of the vehicle to get out and um, and launch a counterattack on that stronghold. And once you get that word of command, you know, you get, go through all sorts of emotions. And I think fear was the biggest. My guest today is Brian Wood, former Colour Sergeant, Princess of Wales Royal Regiment. Brian was awarded the Military Cross, one of Britain's highest awards for gallantry in combat. Brian's also the author of Double Cross, which we'll talk about later, and the subject of the BBC drama Danny Boy. Brian, welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. No, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thank you. So with every guest I've ever had, Pretty much 99% of them turn up at least five minutes late. You turned up on the exact second the clock hit the minute. Is that the military man in you? I think so. I think, you know, timings are critical and not flexible. So if we're, if we're given a timeline, then we should meet that. And, uh, yeah, we should be early rather than late. That's just my philosophy. And I think, yeah, it is the, the military. We are educated to be five minutes before five minutes, um, which isn't a bad thing. And I carry that forward to my day-to-day -day business, really. Amazing, man. As I mentioned there in the intro, obviously at the moment, is um, the BBC drama, Danny Boy. How does it feel to have a drama made surrounding your story? Surreal, if I'm honest. You know, things like this shouldn't really happen to people like me. You know, I volunteered to serve my country. Um, you know, went through... A lot of adversity but I'm not the only person to experience that um, and then yeah to kind of have my life rights optioned three years ago and then it to be played out on screen you know most recently you know it's just uh, it's an incredible achievement I mean I can't yeah I can't put into words what it means I mean it's just yeah it's been a journey and I'm, I'm really really pleased with the outcome so yeah it's um it's good We'll get into the story soon, but on the subject of the drama, how important was it for you to have a, an active role in putting that together and making sure that, you know, it, it was as accurate as possible in certain ways? Yeah, I would never have agreed to do it otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so important that the authentic authenticity was at the forefront of everything that I did and what we stood for, because it's not only me that I was representing, you know, I was representing the British Army, my regiment, and also the bravest of men who were on the ground with me um, during the Battle of Danny Boy. So it was really important. And also kind of more important was the aftermath of the battle, because, you know, I was a trained soldier, I was a, I was a trained commander and leader. And was educated and given the tools to do that but what i wasn't educated for was everything which followed and it was really important for that to be portrayed um how it actually was also and the struggles that i had reintegrating back into normality after being war fighting for six months because that's what it was it was just carnage it was um it tested me in every avenue capable to test a human and uh it I was it tested again once i come home because you know, being away from your family, I left my son when he was four and a half weeks old. I came back after six months, you know, I'd seen and did so much within that tour and I never had any decompression. So trying to fit in was really tough for me. And I also tried to push harder into the family um, to be this dad that I was craving to be, you know, trying to sort of accelerate fatherhood but it doesn't work like that I, looking back I should have took my time I should have been more patient I should have spoke more but you know as men we don't really tend to do that we we bottle a lot of things up inside and you know we just kind of crack on but it's not the best method if I'm honest and uh you know I learned that throughout my journey really 
and um yeah so it's yeah it was uh, it was testing it was a testing time for us and it's like i said it was very important that it was portrayed in the film and i thought they did that magnificently i mean some of the clips they they had of me and my dad especially was overly powerful the, the dialogue that was created and and lucy you know stood by stood by me really didn't have to she could have went a number of times but she was fiercely loyal and um you know like i said stood, stood by me and supported me through the probably toughest time of of my life really so for everyone who is completely unaware of what we're talking about now let's go back to the, the start so you were you were awarded the the military cross for leading a full frontal assault onto a dug-in and determined enemy stronghold during the Battle of Danny Boy. For our audience completely unaware, could you give some context into what the Battle of Danny Boy even was? Yeah, basically we as a regiment went into Iraq at the most violent of times. You know, we wanted to go in there and respect their country, respect their religion, their faith, and try to help restructure um, give a bit of clear direction, clarity, really get involved in the hearts and minds with the children of war, which is really important, and just try to bring some calm to that, we call it area of operations, because I was in Alamara, which was south, uh, south of ba Baghdad, but north of Basra, but we just hit it at the wrong time, and it was just chaos from day one once we landed, and... Um, Basically, Danny Boy started off just like a normal day. I was at a vehicle checkpoint conducting um, a search on vehicles and a search on the occupancies. And then I got a call on my radio saying that there'd been an ambush and we were tasked to go down there and extract two casualties who were quite badly injured from the Argyle and Southern Highlanders. And on the way down, we were just hit by the most violent of situations. These, you know, the militia fighters were in trenches dug in strongholds who were heavily outgunned outnumbered they had very powerful weapon systems on their positions and uh, we just weren't achieving what we can achieve with boots on the ground so basically there was a command made by my superior to prepare me and my men in the back of the vehicle to get out and um and launch a counter-attack on that stronghold and once you get that word of command, you know, you get, go through all sorts of emotions and I think fear was the biggest. And it, if you don't suppress fear, it's very important to acknowledge fear because we're only human, but it's very important to suppress it and don't allow it to take control of you. So you've got to be the overwhelming suppressor for that fear. And I was a young 23 year old being told to get out of this vehicle and I can hear it outside, it's carnage, it's chaos. And um, I've got two other guys who are in the back of the vehicle looking at me for some reassurance, some guidance, some clarity, and uh, a bit of yeah, clear direction. And that's when you have to be that level-headed leader. You have to, I think, you know, give a bit of clarity, be calm in the moment, because when you're calm, it's quite infectious. If you're shouting and panicking and your hair's on fire, then it just, that's very infectious. So it's very calm and, and you give clear direction. And, and, uh, and also, as a leader, I was kind of one to do, be by example. So if I was going to launch, I, went, I was going to go first. And hopefully that would empower the other two to follow. And uh, yeah, we were told to get out. And that's what we did. We, the, the door opened. And I tell you, when you watch Danny Boy, that moment when that door opens and they get out and go into that holding position, it's exactly how it was. You know, we went out, we went into initial holding position because I didn't want to get out of this armoured vehicle. It's so dis disorientating in there. It's boiling hot. I mean, you're at boiling point. It's chaos. The noise is just overwhelming. So to give myself a chance, I needed to go into a holding position that was going to give us a bit of cover from fire and a cover from view. Then I can do what we call an estimate. I can then estimate what is going on in front of me and how I'm going to achieve it. The end state, which was to close and destroy the enemy on that position. And um, yeah, we did that. We went to the holding position. 
Um, we had a little conf lab there. We spoke best best course of action to take this position, and basically we decided to take it on kind of the greatest generation style, which was get up over the top and go across no man's land and and hopefully uh, achieve our aim. And that's what we did. You know, we moved as two teams, a team of three, a team of two, because there was five of us that were in this. There were three in my vehicle, then we were joined by two others, another commander. We were in this position and then we decided to work as, like I said, two teams, a three and a two. And that's what we did. And we started to get closer to the enemy, started to see them start to withdraw from their stronghold. So I knew we had the upper hand. We hadn't taken any casualties at this point as well. So we had a real good momentum and a good aggression and courage and true grit. And I think belief at this point as well, which is a big thing. And um, just carried that momentum through. And then on the approach to like close and destroy everything on that main position, they then all of a sudden, you know, surrendered and, and threw their weapons down, which then means that we have to change from lethal engagement to then rest and restraint. And you get a split second to get that right. It's really difficult, but we did it. A lot of, lot of confusion. Um, there was so much trauma. Enemy fighters have been hit by 30 millimeter, which, you know, it's you're not in a very good state when you're hit by that and this is this is the first time i've been you know in in and amongst it close and personal like this so it was um yeah it was it was just kind of had to switch the moments off and concentrate on us on the ground there were so many weapon systems around trying to get them safe or out of the reach of the militia who were now prisoner of war and um yeah and, and try and kind of take in everything that happened that day which was a lot and um once we managed a little bit of control and we separated the enemy dead from the POWs and that was the first time really I sat down and had a bit of a drink of water and then my sergeant major turned up and this is also portrayed in the film and he asked me if the battlefield was clear but I knew it wasn't clear because I'd seen him I'd seen militia fighters fall back and withdraw so I said it's not clear and then he said, look, me and you are going to go and conduct a clearance patrol. And within 90 metres forward of this main position, we end up in another two engagements, like close and personal. And, um, you know, them enemy combatants, they were, you know, they were killed in action from like a metre away. It was really close. And um, we knew that we were quite vulnerable. So we then went back to the main position. At this point, there was so many vehicles that had turned up um the quick reaction force had turned up there was other areas that um were aware of this which came into our area so we were heavily bolstered up at this point and um and then there was a decision made from from higher intent which is like the bigger picture a lot bigger than what i was i mean i was only a lance corporal which is a junior commander and uh, it was, there was a decision made that we had to now collect the bodies from the battlefield and load them up into the vehicles and take them back for um, identification purposes and DNA purposes. And it was just the worst thing I've ever done, if I'm honest. It was brutal. I mean, it's, it's difficult enough to manage, you know, hand-to-hand -hand fighting and taking, even, if it's, even though it was enemy forces' lives, it was still human life that you, you you experience from so close away you hear the last gasp you can see what's gone into this enemy fighter and it's it's you know it's, it's yes we get trained to do it but not very many people get to do it so close and personal like that so for me it was a lot to take in um yeah it was just that was hideous to then go back and pick up these bodies and then load them onto the vehicle because like i said some of them were in such bad shape you're putting them in bags it was horrendous and then, yeah, we had to then we took them back to camp, and then the back door wouldn't open. And then, one of the lads had to climb through, you know, the bodies with a head torch on and open it. And the stench was just horrendous. It was just that day was just it will be forever imprinted in my my yeah my mind and my headspace until my day on this planet is done. But I can manage it now, but you know, it still creeps up now and again. So that was Danny Boy in a nutshell, really. Obviously, summarised, and I go into a lot more detail in my book, Double Crossed. But, yeah, it was a tough, tough day at the office.
certainly was man like there's so many layers and, and threads in what you just said there i'd love to, to pull on if you you touched on things like fear and and there's, there's so much there so one place i'd love to start is obviously you mentioned that you led outnumbered men <clears throat> into a stronghold so in a situation like that where you know you're statistically at a disadvantage and you're statistically improbable to to come out with the result you wanted how do you manage to accept a decision like that like what went through your mind at that time knowing the statistic improbability mission command mission success if you believe in something and you work together then a lot of time you can achieve mm. and we were outgunned and outnumbered but we also had our vehicle which was giving us um cover and fire we had very highly trained professionals yet yeah, only five of us um however we tactically were, were better we were more aggressive we had more courage and we've got values and we just had a a, a great british ethos to get the job done mm. without minimum fuss but maximum capability and i think that's 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 what you get from 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 british soldiers who are at the tip of the spear and you know we when we commit we never we never sort of fall back. Once you commit forward, that's it. You're off and you're going. And that's kind of the ethos that we stand for is once we get over this, once we launch over the top, we're then committed. So no matter what happens, we move forward. We don't go back. We know what we need to do. And, and that's why I think, you know, we, we have the best military in the world. And, you know, we are shrinking. I know that. However, we still have a massive effect because we're just trained at a very high standard and we don't accept second best and we understand the ethos around teamwork, leadership, vulnerability, inclusiveness, all of this is spoken about. And don't forget as well, we are operating with each other so closely six months prior to even going away on operations. So you get to know the inside and out of the person left and right of you. And it's not a cliche, I was prepared to take a bullet for the person left and right of me because that's how it is in that situation. You're willing to, to give everything for the people that you're working closely with and everything would have been left out on the battlefield. And that's what hurt me later on, that I was prepared to lose my life for my country and, and to lose it on that battlefield because I believed in what we needed to do and what we had to achieve. And the odds were stacked against us, but there are any odds. You know, it's how we can flick them on to then make them maybe be a bit stronger on our behalf. And that's by kind of weighing up and countering what they've got. You know, they had a lot of ammunition, weaponry, but so have we. And we've got this 30 mil and chain gun. So that's a deduction straight away. You know, they are rogue. We're very professional. That's a deduction. So all of this kind of, it happens sharpish because you haven't got time to, to sit down in a boardroom and plan it and then go through some phases. We're in, the, we're in the moment. So you've got to make these big, bold decisions in extreme situations. And like I said, once you commit, you go. And that's how it was really. And that's how, you know, working with a really good, strong team of believe. If there was a chink in the armor, then it then can spiral. But there was zero chink and we were just, we were bang up for it. You mentioned that you were younger then than well, you're younger then than I am now, and you know you were putting your very young, short life in direct danger. What does that is that a case of purpose and meaning above everything? And how did you deal with the situation, knowing about the immediate threat of death? Did that did you even allow that to play on your mind at all, or is that just a a, a recipe for trouble? Yeah, I mean, no one really thinks about that in the moment. You, I volunteered to serve my country and I'm very passionate about this great nation. So I knew there was always going to be a risk when you go on operations, but you don't think about that risk too much because, yeah, it can have, you know, it's, it's a negative thought, isn't it? So you don't want to be involved in that. You know what you've done. You've, you've, you've chosen this career path. You're now in foreign fields and you're fighting every day for your life to try and get some normality back to this country. And um, yeah, so I don't really, I didn't allow myself to, to get 
sort of swept up in them thoughts. I was very passionate about what we needed to achieve and I was a very inclusive leader, wanted people's thoughts, you know, because there was so many good ideas and people are trained at different levels and it's really important to get from the lowest to the highest information. And yeah, you know, age, when I look back now, I, I didn't even think at the time, bloody hell, I was young. Now I'm 40, I look back and think, I was a young dude making some massive decisions um, in extreme intensity. But in the mm. moment, I was trained for that, mm. you know? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because it's always easier analysing the past because you put on different spins on it. But in the moment... You know, I was a young commander with responsibilities and I was given a mission in command and an end state and I had to go and meet it. And that's, we have to just buy into it. If there's questions to be asked, ask positive questions. And, you know, if you need other sort of steers or um, more meat on the bones of the plan, then you ask them questions and don't be afraid to. And even in the most, you know, violent of situations, you're entitled to have that cigar moment. I call it a cigar moment. So... It's caught, it's, it's, you're not knee jerking. You're taking your time, even though you're overwhelmed with pressure. You can still take your moment, pause two, three, and then you can go back in the game. So, yeah, it's um, it's just one of them things that we're soldiers and we're given responsibility. And yeah, regardless of age or you know what situation you're in, you've got to you've got to rise up to that. You said that. Before I've heard you say before that there's no greater leadership challenge than motivating men to put their lives on the line. Yeah. What are the sort of core values and traits of an effective leader, do you think? I think integrity with your men. I think honesty, being approachable, so that if they feel that they would like to speak to you or be open, then you, you should have that. Obviously, there's, there's a fine line, clearly, because when you're a commander, you have the final say. Um, infectiousness, unstoppability, if that's even a word, just that, that unstoppableness to we will get the mission done regardless. We've got contingencies, we've got courses of action, we just need true grit, courage and ultimate determination with a bit of discipline, brilliant ingredients. And that's what it is, it's when you're an infectious leader, when, when you are by example, you know, I, I was never prepared to ask my men to do something that I'm not prepared to do myself. Mm. Never. And they knew that anyway. I, that's how I grew up. That's how my dad ed educated me. You know, you, if you're going to gain respect that you do every hill rep session, you know, instead of being stood on top of that hill telling people to do 10 hill reps, you do 10 hill reps because you're a leader. You, you by example, you get out of that vehicle first because you're that leader you're that example setter. So that's how it was. It is, it is tough. When you are overwhelmed with extreme pressure, there's no harder tool to motivate your men to put their life on the line for you. But it's doable if you build them foundations up as an as a individual and how, you, how I leaded men in battle. I, I, I didn't think I would have a problem, but it is, it is tough because people fight or flight, don't they? It's in the moment. Are they going to get out of that vehicle or am I going to go alone? You know, I was prepared to go alone. And I don't just say that. I was getting out of that vehicle regardless. But because of the way I was as a leader of men, I was 99% confident they would have followed. And clearly they did. So, yeah, it's a task, but it's something that is trust is created over time. And if you're willing to be that you know, approachable leader, you're inclusive, you're, you know, like I said, by example, and you, you, do, you try and do things the right way, I don't think you would have much of a problem of achieving what you need to achieve. But obviously everyone leads differently and everyone has their own point of views, but it's worked for me over the years. What narratives went through your mind during that battle and were there any moments where doubt creeped into your mind at all or is that something you just that just you didn't let in you don't let it you don't have time to think about that if i'm honest it was mm. just we needed to get 120 meters 
we had to close that ground sharpish. Yeah. It was in the film, I actually toned it down because I didn't want it to, to be too Hollywood. It was chaos, the amount of ammunition that was getting, you know, suppressed our way. Um, but yeah, you don't really think of it in the moment. I mean, don't forget, you're dealing with an adrenaline that you can't even explain. There's no injection which will be strong enough to the adrenaline that you'll experience on the battlefield. It's like an outer body experience. And that's why so many people are taking casualties but don't know their casualties because you've just got this overwhelming sense of adrenaline. And like I said, you have all of this ingredients and then you commit. You don't... The, the narrative for me was to close and destroy everyone in that position. That was, that was it. That was my end state. And that's what we, you know, that's what we tried to do. Clearly they surrendered and then it, then in a split second, the narrative changes because rules of engagement, lawfare, clearly. And um, you've, got to, you've got to react in the moment. Like flexibility is a principle of war. You can plan, plan, plan. <clears throat> Soon as it goes chaos, things will change in the plan. And that's why you have contingencies and courses of action. So yeah, in that, it was just commit invest in your team and go and then you know it, clearly when you have time to reflect you think i could have done this different i could have did that but the bottom line i'm sat here speaking to you so i done something right and we done something right you mentioned how great the training is in this country's military but can training all the training in the world can i really prepare you for a situation like that it can help you, um, for sure. You can it can prepare and help you, but it's down to you in the moment. Yeah. That's that's what it's about. It's down to you in the moment, um, fight or flight. But because you're with, I think it's easier to get the job done when you're with your team and you see daily acts of courage daily acts of commitment determination values getting displayed at the highest level selfless commitment you know these these are displayed daily so it's i think it's it's another added ingredient to use as a tool to get the job done so you know i i think your your the training is there to to give you everything that you need to go to war and then it's down to you as an individual because you're never going to know how you're going to react until you're in that moment. When it is chaos, when it's confusion, disorientation, you know, it's, it's, it's down to you. And um, you need to grow up sharpish. You know, I was probably your age or a bit, bit younger when I was cutting about on the battlefield thinking, you know, I've grown up about 10 years in the space of three minutes because you just have to because if you don't you're going to become a casualty or you'll be killed in action um if you try and do things not the right way um yeah are there any lessons from that day that you carry with you in everyday life now um I think dialogue is a big thing. Mm. Like that day was, it was absolutely brutal. And once that day had finished, no one spoke about it. It was like erased from a conversation. And I wish we should have done an after action review because we normally do that. It was just because it was so in the, the intensity of 2004 in Iraq was just so it was just like on another level. It was just, we just didn't have time. We should have made time. And I think a lesson learned for us that we should have sat down and spoke about it and spoke about the, the, the trauma side of things. And, you know, just that whole day, just breaking it down would have been so much better for us to, to, to have done that. And I do that moving forward. So that's, that's what I've learned for not to hold things in um you know you've got to create some dialogue and talk about legacy 
life changing like trauma and extreme trauma is is you being exposed to abnormal events which are going to leave scars and that's an imprint isn't it and you can only you can there's only so much you can self-manage but it's going to creep up on you now and again you know and it did me for for a long time but that's what that's what i do now is i've learned a lesson by not talking and I've acted on that because I did go and speak to a professional in 2009. Once the inquiry kicked off, um, there's too much pressure for me really to manage on my own. And then I went and I then went back to all the legacy stuff in 2004. And it was just the best thing I'd ever done. So for me, it's, you know, creating dialogue, not being scared to speak about some of the pressured situation that you've been in or um, stuff that has affected you. You know, if you talk about it, it's a problem shared, isn't it? So, yeah, moving forward, I always talk about some of the problems that we're, we're, we're facing. So, yeah. What advice would you give to people on the process of handling fear? What is your approach and process to fear now? And, yeah, is it about just having that, that cigar moment, as you mentioned before? I think you've got to acknowledge fear. Mm fear is you know it's it's around us it's it's what stops people from achieving their dreams it's what stops people from going for their goals because they're scared of failure you know they are they're scared stiff and there's so much fear about taking a forward step because it's in the unknown and it's so important to acknowledge that definitely however there is ways around it and you've just got to be bold enough um, and commit, I think. You know, the cigar, the cigar moment is, is like, for me, it's, you can hit fear from all different angles. You know, it's doing a, a skydiving, that's fear. It's reacting to effective enemy fire, there's going to be an element of fear there's fear of starting your own business there's there's so much you know, around fear and for me i just think you know the biggest thing is acknowledge it there is a way around it and you've just got to try and figure that out and then commit and then in the most extreme situations is you have to allow yourself a bit of time process to understand what it is suppress the fear understand your mission command and then launch and then just commit and go that's that's how i deal with it i'm no oracle I'm not the, you know, I haven't got a pamphlet on this, you know, Woody's pamphlet of fear. It's just what I've done. Um, you know, I started my, my business, keep attacking in a pandemic. There was a lot of anxiety and fear, but I was like, risk versus reward. You know, I'm going to go. There's, of course, it's, there's fear. I've got a family. I've got a mortgage to pay. But I'm going to go and I'm going to commit and I'm going to make it work. And there is a lot of fear there, but you acknowledge it and then punch forward. As covered in the book, Double Cross, um, you were falsely accused of war crimes. When you first found out, what did that do to you mentally? Yeah, it was, that was a tipping point for me to go and speak to someone. So, yeah, it crushed me. Because I like to think I'm a man of honour. And we achieved so much that day. I mean, it was, you know, that, that day will, will always be, um, you know, the, the biggest day of my life, for sure. And we were awarded, you know, the, I was awarded the military cross, went to Buckingham Palace with my parents and my wife. And, and then, you know, five years later, then this, this public inquiry being launched, it going into all of the press, panorama, newspaper, oh, I was, so all of a sudden now my integrity is in question and I'm a man of values. And it was, that was the hardest thing. And, you know, there came a point where it was just too much pressure. I hadn't dealt with legacy stuff. And this was just the tip of the iceberg. And I was just like, I need to go and get some support because I'm in a bad way. So, yeah, it punished me, the allegations. Where did you find the sort of resilience to 
sort of power through and, and, and deal with those and clear your name because it's almost like you were asked to fight the second battle all over again. Yeah, it was a harder battle as well because like I said before, you know, I knew how to be a soldier, but I didn't have to deal with all of this on home soil. You know, I was getting accused of these barbaric war crimes, murder, mutilation, mistreatment. I was like, how? I was in like complete full-on ambush that, you know, was triggered by the enemy. We counted it. How all of a sudden now am I getting accused of these barbaric crimes? It's like, I just couldn't understand it. But every day I had to get up, I said, draw the curtains back and move forward and attack the day. That's what I always just say. Attack the day, keep attacking. Attack the day, keep attacking. And attack and attack and attack. And um, that's what I did daily. And it was harder days than others. I didn't, sometimes didn't want to get up. Sometimes I just couldn't be bothered to, to read what I was reading in the press or read some of the messages that I was receiving. Is this true what I'm reading in the newspapers? All of a sudden, I'm like having to justify myself. But I didn't allow myself to play victim. Could have been easy just to say, well, you know, this is unfair. It's, and it was, but I wanted to go on the front foot. And I believe... I knew that we were all innocent and we just had to, yeah, show up each day and try and squeeze a positive out of such of a negative situation. This went on for five years. So it's a long time to, to revisit statements, to go into interviews all the time, to get cross-examined, to go into the dock. It was like a lot going on. Um, but you're never out of the game if you're willing to go the distance. You know, and I, it, there was times that I was exhausted physically and mentally, but I kept attacking and that's what it's all about. You mentioned the, um, the business you started in lockdown. Obviously there's the book, there's media duties, there's the film. It's mm -hmm. quite a shift from, you know, your career. So what lessons have you carried through with you from your military career to the corporate world now? Oh, there's, there's honestly so many. Um, military give you such a great foundation of understanding and dissecting leadership, understanding and dissecting values, which sometimes are wayward at the moment. Mm. People, you know, aren't really aligned with their with their values, and uh, I think it needs to kind of there needs to be a re, I wouldn't say re-education, but people need to look at their values a little bit you know, more, I don't know, more closely. And uh, I was just very lucky to be in an environment where you're educated to, to each value it's di dissected and um, like understanding timelines, understanding command and control, understanding pressure, understanding mental and physical fitness. You know, all of these are what the military have given me. So I'll just extract that straight into what I'm doing now. So business planning, you know, your timeline, which is a one to three to five year plan, what that looks like, how am I going to get there? How am I going to achieve it? What potential hurdles are going to come across? You know, all of this is exactly the same as plan, you know, planning or similar, a deliberate attack on a position because you have to plan. And I'll just, you know, I've learned so much from the military that, um, yeah, I'm fortunate enough to, to definitely um, implement some of the stuff that I'm doing now in business. And I'm learning. I'm no entrepreneur by any stretch. You know, I'm just Woody, who served 17 years in the military and now runs his own business. But it's definitely helped me for sure. I mean, the energy, the drive, the passion, the message that the business delivers, I'm just so invested in it. And then everything else, so I, the other tools that I've got, I kind of just, yeah, put that on paper. And uh, it's definitely helped me so far and it's and it works. But, you know, I'm still figuring it all out myself, you know. And I've learned, I've made so many mistakes. I've learned so much. And um, it's definitely harder than what I thought being a business owner. There's um, it's different types of pressure, but I'm really enjoying it, you know, and um, long may it continue. We've had um, quite a lot of, of military um, guys on the show. Obviously, from the UK, we've had Ollie Alton, Mark Billingham, um, 
Dean Stott, um, you know, Jay Morton, and they all talk about identity. And it's interesting because this seems like a sort of a worldwide problem because even with our American military guests in, you know, General Stanley McChrystal, they all talk about how, as a military man, your entire identity is tied into that career. And yeah. when you come out of the military, there's always this challenge of sort of defining who you are now because you're not the military guy anymore. Did you struggle with your identity when you came out? Uh, I think everyone does to a degree because you're in a belonging. You're in an organisation that is unique and different to every other organisation out there. You know, you are... As one, you're in this belonging. The com camaraderie is on another level. You go through these different courses. You progress through your, the rank structure. There is then so much respect amongst peers, and uh, you know, and you have a reputation. If 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 you're a good soldier, then you have a reputation. You are known to be this charismatic leader. This you know, punchy operator and someone who's, you know, gone above and beyond in their military career. So you are kind of at, at the top of your game. But in Civvy Street, no one doesn't, them titles don't matter. Having a military cross, being a colour sergeant, you know, being involved in the Battle of Danny Boy, that that's irrelevant. But in the military, that's gold. That's like quite a bit of a gold standard. So, when I come away from it, it's like, yeah, who, who, who am I now? But I quickly, you know, understood that I need to re-identify myself. Purpose is the biggest thing because in the military, you are given clear direction. Everything's pretty much, you know, written down for you, what you where you need to be, what time you need to be there, what kit, what equipment, and then you're with the lads, done. But when you come away from this, you're on your own and you haven't now got that purpose because what is now, what is your purpose in life? You know, you've been involved in some of the most extraordinary events within the military, being like going away in, into theatre war, being tested to the extreme you know, with, with leadership and with everything else that comes with that. And now Civvy Street, there is not a threat. There is, you've then given everything up that you stood for. But I said this to before, you can't play victim card. You've got to figure out your purpose. You've got to, what, make, what makes soldiers tick, in, in, in my opinion, is having a structure and having a purpose. Two basic things. It makes you tick. So I knew that made me tick. So I had to find that sharp edge. And then your identity will follow on from that, I believe. And then, yeah, I was, I wouldn't say I was fortunate because I worked hard to get, to get what, you know, to, to what we've got now. So it's definitely a struggle though. Everyone will say the same. It's your, your identity, which is something quite special within that organization to having, you know, refined and redefined you as an individual when you're out in, in the real world. But it's doable, it's achievable. You just got to figure out what that is and work hard to, to regain some sort of identity or a new identity, you know. It's, yeah, it's something that everyone will go through who leaves and transitions from the military. It's just the way of life. I have three final questions that we ask every guest um, to finish. The first one, we've referenced Double Crossed a few times now, obviously your book. It's impacted so many people but for you are there any books or authors that you've read throughout your life that have had an impact on yourself i'd ask you a question a lot of books um shoe dog mm. big thing especially the business that i'm in now with sports and, and loungewear is it, it was um very inspiring from that um military books bravo two zero was back in the day was a big read of mine. You know, I remember that happening um, growing up. I recently done a podcast with Chris Ryan as well. 
Um, so yeah, I, I read that from cover to cover. But there's the lads that you've just spoken about. They've all released books, you know, and you'll be able to extract some incredible life lessons from all of them, from Jay Morton to Mark Billingham to Jason Fox to Dean Stott. You know, the the guys at Ollie Ollerton that you mentioned. They're all they're all distinguished authors in their own right. So you know, you can you can for sure get on get on them books and and sort of educate yourself with the whole military side of it but also there's some great life lessons within them books as well so yeah there's a few if you had to <clears throat> sort of distill your life lessons down and you were given the opportunity to broadcast just one little message or one lesson that every person on the planet would hear and you think everyone can stand to benefit from hearing this. What would Brian Wood's message to the world be? You're not entitled to nothing in life. You know, you've really got to work hard for it. And if you want to achieve, you've got to go and earn it. That's a big philosophy. That's what I was educated with my dad. You know, you're not... You're not entitled to anything. You have to work hard for it to achieve your goals and to achieve your dreams. You know, they're not just given to you. Talent, talent alone is never going to be enough. You've got to really graft it. You've got to you know, attack each day with a purpose. That's my statement. The last question I have for you today, this, the answer to this could be anything. It could be, you know, it could be family. It could be friends. It could be a career. But for Brian Wood, what makes a life worth living? My well, family. Mm. You know, they they are everything to me. And they're like so many families out there who have gone through some tough times, adversity. You know, they have been through everything with me and they're still here. And we're the happiest we've ever been. So, yeah, that's a life worth living is look after the people that support you and love you because they're the people that will look after you and support you when you most need them and it's family beautiful brian let these guys listening know where they can find yourself online find your your business your book the the film let them know where they can find you um yeah just all, all social media platforms brian wood mc uh instagram twitter linkedin uh facebook uh, my book, uh, Double Crossed, it's just been re-released as in the, the cover photos actually of it because it now says um, the story that inspired BBC drama Danny Boy, which is really quite cool. Yeah. And uh, Yeah, I'm proud of that. And BBC iPlayer to watch Danny Boy. It's on, I think it's still got 11 months remaining. So if people want to watch um, you know, my life story, then you can head across and, and jump on BBC iPlayer and and, and give it a watch but no I just really I don't take anything for granted and I hope I've added some value to you for your listeners and yeah I'm on a bit of a journey at the moment and uh let's see where the destination is but I don't know myself yet so yeah it's all good I love it I'll leave all the links in the description below man you certainly did bring so much value it's been one of my favorite ones I've done in a in a long time so thank you so much for bringing that to the show today and um, I wish you all the best with all your ventures. No, thank you. Mutual respect. Keep doing what you're doing because it's important, you know, like people like yourself, getting this content, sharing this content, because it will definitely have an impact um, to so many people. So, yeah, keep up the great work and, uh, yeah, keep attacking.